Welcome to the Creeland Podcast, your go-to source for real estate discussions, good business practices, insights, and tips. We talk about commercial real estate leasing and investments, lease legal matters, land developments, cryptocurrency, and digital assets. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and don't forget to share, like, and subscribe. Hi, guys, and welcome to the third episode of the Creeland Podcast. My name is Mirali Gary, and I'm here with my partner, Adam Watson. Hi, everyone. Today's topic is about achieving the CCIM pen, the process, its advantages, and how a certified commercial investment member can help you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, a CCIM is a certified commercial investment member, and the designation is awarded by the CCIM Institute. And for over 50 years, the CCIM's designation is gold standard for commercial real estate professionals more so appraisers, developers, investors, lenders, and other service professionals. I started my career in commercial real estate, uh, I believe back in 2010. I needed to learn the language, the cash flow analysis, uh, marketing uh, side of things, and the user decision, investment analysis. I I had no idea where to get started. I wanted to learn and uh, differentiate myself in the marketplace. So the CCIM pin was something really interesting and and meaningful for me to uh, advance my career and uh, I was at Cushman and Wakefield back then. It was around 2014 when I started to uh, pursue my CCIM designation and I was probably doing uh, two to three courses a year and wrapped it up in that two year and finally wrote my CCIM uh, pin in uh, 2016. Yeah, that's awesome. Where did you write your uh, pin? I was as in Atlanta, Georgia. Is was when I wrote it, and uh, it was really nerve wracking because yeah. two years of uh, studying had gone into it. And uh, but uh, it was great. I'm really grateful for the opportunities that it has uh, brought, and uh, I've met a lot of new people and made new connections throughout. That's awesome. That's awesome. So my journey started back in 2020, and that was actually right before the pandemic happened. Yeah. And um, that was uh, held up in Barrie, Barrie, Ontario. I wrote uh, my exam in Barrie and uh, it was a four, four or five day course, nine to five. Met a lot of new people, a lot of new people. It was a great networking opportunity. Everyone was in the same boat as me. You know, they didn't really know what to expect. Um, some have maybe taken some other courses in real estate. Uh, some were not even brokers, some were investors, some were uh, people who uh, are property managers yeah. and just eventually wanted more knowledge of, of what CCM can really offer as a whole. Um, for those who have taken any business or commerce university courses, um, like myself, I could compare CCM 101, which is the first course, uh, comparable to like a finance one course. Yeah. So you kind of go over a lot of the same material you would have in the first year of your university career. Uh, stuff like the IRR, um, annual operating data, um, you would go over some cash flow analysis, present value, um, and, and everything of that kind of nature. So it was really good to just kind of uh, you know, get refreshed on it. Touching base on, uh, on on the cash flow analysis, there you get a details with these uh, with the excels and the various case studies that uh, you uh, you complete as part of your uh, core courses. Mm-hmm. What are uh, some of the advantages that uh, you feel in your day to day practice now that you have done the one on one cash flow analysis? Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you see those excels coming into day to day practice, and have you used it in any one of your particular transactions? Absolutely. Some of the uh, the case studies used in the course are very very lifelike. Yeah. Um, everything from all the questions that are being asked to you, you know, you really get an idea of you know what to expect out there when you're working with real clients as opposed to just reading a textbook and going through questions and and whatnot. So um, yeah, we we've done a lot of deals, uh, both myself and Ali, using those uh, cash flow analysis worksheets, um, which are actually provided to you um, that you can use and take home with you. Uh, which is a very good add-on, right? So that you don't have to create these Excel sheets yourself. 
Um, so taking the CCM 101, you get a lot of material you can bring home with you and uh, you can definitely uh, assist your clients in many ways of you know of what you've learned. They have the mortgage calculator is a cash flow discount uh, analysis. Uh, they have net present value calculations, as you mentioned previously, mm -hmm. internal rate of return calculations. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the nice uh, spreadsheets that I like is you know whether you should lease or purchase mm -hmm. and then the comparisons for a potential tenant that may be in a position to either lease or purchase their their, their property and uh, determining how and what is the best direction to go is, is a great uh, way of using those um, cash flow analysis yeah absolutely absolutely you can definitely definitely take advantage of all of those worksheets because i know it does take a long time to kind of you know build up a whole uh, analysis sheet for those uh, for your clients yeah. so yeah i remember as i was uh, pursuing my ccim designation i just when i finished my pin i, I was working on uh, analyzing this investment property that uh, included three retail tenants mm -hmm. and then there was also a gas station business with a car wash mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to utilize everything that I've learned from yeah. uh, my knowledge to do a full detailed cash flow analysis from you know before tax analysis to after tax analysis and just give a good perspective of that opportunity mm -hmm. it was a great exercise and uh, it, it really helped paint a great picture with our clients and a good picture of the investment opportunity so as buyers are evaluating they know exactly what are the numbers and uh, and how to evaluate such mm -hmm. opportunity. So Ali, back in uh, 2016, while you were working at Cushman and Wakefield, you obtained your final designation CCIM PIN. Correct. How have you been able to help your clients? Well, it's 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 been a it's been a great uh, value add for me and my clients. I was able I was this particular transaction was a land development uh, transaction and. I was able to use all of my skills and resources to study the market and, and explain to my client, you know, what is a resale in this market, what are the demographics in this market, and CCIM as, as part of its uh, membership, you get access to uh, Esri database and a lot of great uh, um, information and analytical tools to be able to really evaluate uh, a development opportunity. And with the tools and the resources that I had and the knowledge that I had to evaluate what is the comparables, what is the buying uh, price that we should, or the purchase price, the ideal purchase price, mm -hmm. and uh, what can we build on this, and what is the resale value of this, and uh, mm -hmm. what are the complications involved, and, and be able to paint the whole picture of the opportunity was what led to that potential uh, deal getting over the finish line. Yeah, that's awesome, that's awesome. And I think you mentioned Esri. So for our audience members at home, could you maybe kind of identify what Esri is? And yeah, of course. Esri is, is uh, they track uh, census demographical information throughout Canada. And uh, they also track uh, traffic time and uh, to a particular property during rush hour, mm -hmm. off rush hour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for some of our retailer clients, they particularly want to know how fast their customers can get to them during various hours of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, with uh, Esri, you could also have uh, obviously household income, uh, race, uh, demographic, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, many other uh, tools that census. Uh, Government Canada tracks that would be available through us in a very nicely laid out manner. Right, right. So yeah, CCIM, um, site to do business through CCIM um, offers that Esri platform. Right, that's so right, that's yeah. that's a great tool that uh, anyone who's interested in obtaining their PIN throughout their journey, they'll have all access to that tool. Correct. Now, I know, Adam, you're pursuing your CCIM uh, designation and you've been a candidate for a couple of years. What are some of the courses that are involved in achieving the CCIM pen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, so I'm on course number four. So I've done my 101, my 102, my 103, and now I'm starting my 104 come next spring. So your CCIM 101 talks about the financial analysis. Mm -hmm. Your CCIM 102 discusses the market analysis. Your 103 is the user decision analysis, and your number four is your investment analysis. So those are the core courses, 101 to 104, that you definitely need. In addition to that, you will also need a negotiation course, an ethics course. I see, I see. Well, thank you for that. And what about uh, the qualification process? So after you complete those four courses mm -hmm. and the two electives, 
Is there any qualification requirement yes. thereafter? Yes, so that's a good question, Ali. So after you, um, you've done all your courses, the electives, the ethics, you now have to submit a portfolio. So your portfolio submission is very important and a critical part of the whole process from A to Z. So once you submit your portfolio, the CCIM committee will review it and you'll either get the green light or not to proceed and, and write your uh, comprehensive exam. And that can be usually taken anywhere in the USA. I see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's twice a year that you could write the, uh, the uh, pending exam, usually during the governance meeting in the fall uh, exactly. or in the springtime. Exactly, exactly. And just to touch on their portfolio submission, there's qualifying attributes to that. And uh, to dive into a little bit, and everything's, remember, everything's online so you can double check yourself, but there's three or more qualifying activities totaling to $30 million in transactions that you need to accomplish, or there's 10 qualifying totaling 10 million, and lastly, 20 plus qualifying commercial transactions. So that can include anything from leasing to, to selling equivalent to that one. I see, I see. Yeah. So essentially, the Institute is ensuring that you have some experience related to commercial transactions Correct. before being able to write your exam Correct. and sit at the table with, uh, with the rest of the commercial investment members. Correct, uh, Correct. I see. Correct. I exactly. See. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I'm very proud of, of my plaque. It's, it's right here, 2016 was a year and uh, it's one of uh, my greatest achievements and took some time and I'm very proud of, uh, of all the values that uh, has, has brought to me and my business and of course to our clients. So once you've obtained your CCM pin and you, you want to explore other avenues in the CCM industry, what are some of the options that are available to you? How do you get on maybe a couple boards or how do you grow within the CCM community? You have a lot of opportunities to grow after you have uh, achieved your, your CCIM pen. One thing in particular is you could potentially join your local chapter. And I know we have a chapter here in Toronto, the Central Canada chapter is, is, or is, has a lot of members, over 100 members. And we also have the Western Canada CCIM uh, chapter, which has a lot of members, or again, over 100 members uh, based around Vancouver and surrounding uh, markets. So you definitely have an ability to network. The, the chapters host educational uh, events, courses, and uh, you're able to grow within the chapter as well by becoming a potential committee member or eventually working your way up to become a more board member, then eventually uh, to leadership roles mm -hmm. as uh, president and, and president-elect within that chapter. And thereafter, if you continue, you could potentially assist the Institute based out of Chicago and, and, and grow within the CCIM Institute mm -hmm. as well. So a lot of leadership positions. There. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay. So you mentioned that there's a Western chapter and a Central Canada chapter Correct. here. Yeah. Um, and there's a board of directors for each. What are some of the positions maybe that someone could get into uh, if they want to become a board member? Well, uh, when I started uh, becoming uh, or pro starting with this journey of uh, becoming a CCIM designee, I actually went to one of uh, Central Canada's uh, networking events mm -hmm. and they were having a board of directors meeting thereafter. And I went to uh, Walter Louis. Uh, he's still with our board, uh, Central Canada chapter board. And uh, I, I spoke to Walter. I said, "Hey, Walter, what can I do to, um, you know, join this organization?" Yeah. And at that time, I was probably in Cushman and Wakefield, probably four or five years in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I again, uh, Mr. Peter Mason, who I have a lot of respect for, I asked him, "Hey, how can I grow within this associate association and within right. this commercial industry?" So he suggested you should get involved with various different commercial boards. And uh, there's NAOP, there's CCIM, there's TREP, URIA, SIOR. So, yeah. so, there's, so I, I figured, okay, you know what? I'm going to uh, go to this networking event, CCIM, and see what they're about. And, uh, and just ask them to see if there's any committee or board yeah. position. Yeah. And thereafter, they suggested, hey, yeah, there's a committee uh, for education. And if you're interested, uh, come to our next board meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sure enough, I went to the next board meeting and uh, I, I eventually liked what they were offering and how they were helping um, 
commercial brokers, investors, and, and every, anybody that's interested in learning about the commercial industry. Mm-hmm. So I became involved and uh, I was a board of directors for a couple of years. And then thereafter, um, there was a president elect mm-hmm. and eventually I became the uh, president for the Central Canada chapter. But ironically, that was during COVID and uh, we couldn't really do anything. <laughs> yeah, so. there's not much. Uh, usually there's a lot of networking events. People put a lot of faces to names, but as we all know, you know, throughout the pandemic, it was very challenging, but Correct. nevertheless, I mean, we did an outstanding job and uh, there was a lot of people who ended up joining Thank the, uh, the CCIM yeah. um, chapter. Yeah, we weren't able to host classes, but then um, uh, Zoom came into existence yeah. and uh, we've had some virtual classes. And uh, thereafter, I I, uh, I ran for one year as the president, as, as president of the Central Canada chapter. Right. And um, once you become a president of a chapter, then you have the opportunity to um, uh, be uh, a candidate for regional vice president within the CCIM Institute. So, and then I enrolled myself as the first vice president for Region 12, which is Central Canada chapter and Western Canada chapter. And, and uh, my job was pretty much to ensure that both the Western Canada and Central Canada chapter members are collaborating and they're, they're adding value to their members and, and hosting um, events for their members and, and trying to um, have joint uh, connections so that the Central Canada members and the Western mm-hmm. Canada chapters are united and they're, right. and, and, and they're also connected with the CCIM Institute. So mm-hmm. you know, we host uh, various um, uh, joint uh, collaboration events. Ali, if you were to maybe just you know let our audience know, uh, what would be one key takeaway uh, for someone who is maybe never have heard of CCM until till today, and uh, and one key takeaway that maybe the viewers could have um, before they start their CCM journey. And you just have to ask yourself, do you know everything there is to commercial real estate investments? And if you're an investor, do you know how to underwrite and analyze an investment opportunity to protect your investment? If you're a broker, do you have the capability of servicing your clients mm-hmm. and, and providing them with ethic and competent service? So you, you got to ask yourself those questions. If you want to become uh, certain and become a certified and be confident in your ability to deliver sound service to your clients, then I think uh, becoming a certified commercial investment member is, is a great uh, yeah. designation. So yeah, the award courses are, are great. I remember when I was uh, on the board of directors as part of the education committee, we hosted a full day of uh, land development uh, process and the right. full entitlement process to get it from concept, from from, from from various different investors mm-hmm. who get involved and in what their objectives are and when each investor would cash out and pass the baton to the next right. investor to, put it, to pretty much get it from uh, farmland to a fully developed uh, yeah. project. So right. it was great. It was great. We hosted the event at, at the Niagara Falls uh, and it was a full day course. The institute was there. We had about 20, 30 students and the instructor walked us through each phases and that, that is a work courses that's available to the CCIM designees at a discounted uh, price uh, and is a great value to our members. That's awesome, that's awesome. Okay, Ali, so so before um, getting into your real estate journey, right, you had uh, some previous uh, experience obtaining an asset uh, in Whitby. Correct. And um, tell us a little bit about that and maybe even before that, your construction background. Uh, well, construction I started back when I was in high school, uh, grade 12. Uh, we, I did a pre-apprenticeship for electrical. I just loved electrical wires. Back then in high school, I had speakers everywhere and yeah. connected them and, you know, <laughs> with subwoofers and what have you. So I was attracted towards um, construction and, and uh, wiring and what have you. So I went into electrical apprenticeship right out of high school. Mm-hmm. I had great economic courses in grade 12, mind you. I, yeah. I chose to go into apprenticeship and it's been one of the greatest decisions. Uh, thereafter, I went to Central uh, High Tech uh, School for another year of uh, pre-apprenticeship after mm-hmm. I graduated from grade 12 from Marc Arnault Institute. And uh, when I was at Central Tech, we did one year of pre-apprenticeship uh, to electrical construction, and I did co-op place, placement for another six months thereafter, mm-hmm. and, uh, and found a journeyman and uh, that would take me on as, a, as an apprentice. And uh, it's a five-year program, and I had to go through George Brown, Durham College, and 
long story short, I, I, I obtained my electrical uh, license. And uh, while I was pursuing that, I was also working in construction as well. So mm -hmm. I, was, I was wiring custom built houses along the bridal path and uh, seeing a lot of ground up product being built and we would go in at various phases of the development mm -hmm. to do the wiring because electrical wiring happens when the foundation is being pour poured to rough in the main service line then you go in before the drywall is mm -hmm. put up and installation is done then you go back in when this paint so you kind of see the full process yeah. up and uh, it's it's a great asset that I've learned I hate it at times because uh, you know Canada winter uh, <laughs> from uh, January to uh, April, it was tough to work, but yeah. uh, a little cold, really cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially new construction, no windows, just wood frame, uh, right. and uh, it was tough. Uh, but it was a great experience, and I and I, and I and I and I learned that that construction experience, which is a great asset to me now in helping our clients and helping us invest in uh, pro projects for ourselves and our clients, and or developing projects to overlook from the ground up. That's awesome. That's awesome. Why don't you touch on how you got into Cushman Wheatfield? Yeah. Because that was a whole other story too, which uh, was pretty cool. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's an interesting story. Uh, I was actually a client of Cushman and Wakefield. Uh, I was working construction and I wanted to dabble into the commercial investment field, mm -hmm. read a lot of books and uh, looking how to break barriers into commercial real estate investments. I, uh, I started searching MLS and started searching around and started calling brokers and I happened to call a broker at Cushman Wakefield, uh, mm -hmm. Paul Howitt. He's, uh, and I was thankful to him because it was his efforts that brought me in to the commercial real estate right, industry right. and everything else happened thereafter. But I actually happened to call him to say, hey, I saw your sign. I want to buy a commercial property. Right, and right. Help me. And uh, I said, you know, we've got some money saved up and my parents are asking me to help them uh, put this money t towards either buying another house or commercial real estate property right, and right. English was a barrier for them so they weren't really uh, they were looking for me to guide them and here I am not knowing what to do so I called Paul and Paul came and uh, we talked about what it is that we wanted and at that time we had our Whitby property and we were looking to leverage that property and buy another property so uh, Long story short, he helped us with a few options and uh, I happened to be, you know, the seller's favorite buyer and uh, he <laughs> liked working with me more than, <laughs> than Paul, but uh, long story short, uh, we ended up buying that property and uh, we created a lucrative uh, vendor take back nice. where the seller held back, you know, three quarters of the purchase price and nice. uh, we leveraged our current Whitby property and uh, used that as the initial deposit and uh, and thereafter Paul's like hey you're good with this why don't you uh, come on board with Cushman yeah. and uh, you know I went through a couple of interviews and uh, thereafter uh, I made it yeah, and I was awesome. so stoked yeah that's awesome that's awesome what a journey that must have been yes wow. yes 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 but uh, you know shortly thereafter uh, Paul had left Cushman uh, and uh, was all alone. So mm -hmm. I needed to figure out how to figure out the commercial real estate industry, having a background in construction. Mm -hmm. Now all of a sudden on a corporate field yeah. with uh, no guidance uh, it was, was tough. So pursuing the CCIM designation is, is, is what has helped me understand the ropes, the language, the underwriting of uh, an investment opportunity mm -hmm. and has given me the, the confidence and the competent competency that I need in order to uh, help my clients. And that has been great for the past five, six years since I've mm -hmm. uh, obtained my pen. That's awesome. That's awesome here. That's awesome. Yeah, but uh, you came out of university, I remember. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, what made you want to get your CCIM pin? And I know you're pursuing it. What, what excited you about it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm just going all the way back. I, I always wanted to get into real estate in high school. And I remember going to my guidance counselor saying, what courses do I really need yeah. to take to, to get into real estate? And I didn't know if I wanted to get into residential. I didn't know if I wanted to do commercial. Um, and he said, you know what? 
take business courses. Yeah. Right? Focus on business. And that's exactly what I did. I went all the way up through university. I took all the finance one, finance two courses um, at Ontario Tech U. I went uh, and took you know a lot of entrepreneurship courses. And uh, right when I graduated at university, um, you know, I started working with Ali back in uh, 2015. And uh, my journey throughout uh, Cushman and Wakefield, I had to get licensed. So back the back then the course was, uh, I believe the real estate course was offered through Aria. I, I was working um, uh, at Cushman and Wakefield full time while obtaining my license. And once I graduated and, and finished obtaining the, the articling section of my license, I said, now what? Now what do I, what, how else can I really advance my knowledge yeah. in, in, in commercial real estate industry? Because I was pretty young at the time. I started when I was 22. And so when CCM came around, that's when I said, okay, this is what I'm going to take um, and, and eventually you know, become very, very comfortable, feel comfortable in the industry and, and confident. It gave me so much uh, education experience that you know, when there were situations presented to me, the, um, I felt very, very confident on, on handling that situation. So Ali, tell us about some of the events that were hosted while you were on the board of directors of the CCM Central Chapter. Yeah, so when I was at the Central Canada Chapter, we hosted various networking events. We had uh, various guest speakers, guest speakers that would come from lawyers to lenders to motivational speakers and coaches come and uh, provide uh, various topic discussions for our members. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Ali, tell us, what are some other advantages of becoming a CCM? Well, some other advantages is for my personal uh, investments, for my own underwriting of investment opportunities. I, I always look to partner up with friends and family and, and other uh, colleagues on investment opportunities. So how do you best protect your investment? You mm -hmm. can either rely on what somebody else is telling you, mm -hmm. or you go in and you become a certified commercial investment member. You can evaluate that, un that investment opportunity to ensure that this investment is going to provide you at least two to three times multiple equity returns right. in the near five, 10 or 15 year horizon, however long of a term of an objective you have with that investment. So you can really cash flow, uh, uh, really analyze a cash flow investment opportunity or a redevelopment opportunity for your personal use and for your personal investments to kind of give you the comfort that, hey, this, mm -hmm. this is going to be a solid investment and I'm putting in my whole life savings into this yeah. venture. I'm relying on my own knowledge yeah. on my own competency as much as I'm relying on other uh, professional consultants involved in the transaction. But you have you give yourself assurance and a peace of mind by by being a CCIM and by underwriting your own deals too. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. I feel like there's a lot of us out here who uh, may help our clients transact but then themselves don't do, Correct. they don't become the investor and they're Correct. not buying the real estate. So this is a great tool to essentially get into that uh, industry where you actually become the investor. Absolutely. And, uh, and make your own it's funny you say that. Uh, when I was at Cushman and Wakefield and I saw some of these great top performers and you know they were selling <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, over a million dollars in revenue and commission to themselves. and having their clients buy millions of dollars and resell back after a couple of years for millions profit. So I'm like, hey, you know the, the opportunities exist. You're taking those opportunities and bringing it to your investor clients, which is great. But sometimes if you have some equity in, and you have a group of circle of friends that you could potentially venture on these investment opportunities, mm -hmm. why don't you do it? And mm -hmm. very seldom, do real estate brokers invest yeah. in properties? They find opportunities for their clients, but they don't themselves get invested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's definitely uh, a great opportunity to to, uh, to dive into. Correct. Sure. So, so, Adam, um, I know you've done your 102, which is uh, the market analysis. That entails, you know, for an office user when they have four or five office options, how do they narrow down? You know, what is the best deal? And how can they compare one office product to the to the second? What, what are some of the tools that is available to you through the CCIM Institute to help you provide 
your client to some solid direction? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very good question, Ali. Um, actually, it's funny you ask because uh, we actually just did a transaction not too long ago uh, with a college and they were looking for space in the Ajax region. Correct. Um, they were looking for anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 of square feet um, to open up a second location from the West End to now the East End. And uh, some of the tools that I learned within CCIM uh, really, really came into effect uh, for this situation. Um, being able to compare the net free rent period, the fixturing period, uh, understanding what the tenant inducement allowance um, kind of correlates with what the overall bottom line of the rent will be. Um, yeah. and, and being able to open up a spreadsheet and list all the comparables and the surrounding um, uh, amenities around that area can really you know, impact the overall decision of, of what the tenant is gonna make. There's so many factors and what CCM really helps uh, is, is really identifying those factors and how to present that to your client so that they can have a full understanding of, of you know, making a decision when it comes uh, when it, when it comes, time, when it comes to time, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, sure. absolutely. So essentially, you know, identifying property A, B, C, all four or five properties and then identifying what are, what, what are some of the offerings from each one of those landlords yeah. and then comparing it with the tenant's needs and kind of giving a good overview of, uh, of, the, of, of the available options that they have and what is the best option for the precisely, customer. Precisely, I mean, as a broker, you really want to try to illustrate a picture for your clients, right? And that just helps them, you know, internally make a, a better decision, right? So the more you can articulate, you know, like what Ali said, putting it in a chart, um, being able to um, uh, identify the pros, the cons of each site really makes it easier for your client. Uh, in the short and long term run to make an informed decision. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned uh, identifying the potential option and that's, you know, after canvassing the market. So now that you've identified an opportunity and you're looking to act on that, what are some of the negotiation tactics that you have learned uh, as a CCIM designee which can benefit your clients? That's a great question, Ali, that you asked uh, and actually, um, perfect scenario because negotiation course that you learn at CCAM covers everything that you need to know uh, with respect to negotiation. One critical part I learned about the negotiation course is your BATNA. So BATNA stands for Best Alternative Negotiated Agreement. So really what it does is what happens when people can't see eye to eye, right? Right. So, I see. So essentially it's a, it's, it's a chart and you have the, the yeah. various stakeholders involved and the various issues involved and then you kind of create a little commonalities and what what parties agree to and yeah. which which parties don't agree and kind of make them see eye to eye the main issues yeah. and then also articulate what they have in common and and, and hopefully be able to meet some middle ground see eye to eye exactly I see. exactly I see. Yeah, that's right that's great that's great okay cool um okay now uh, i don't what about if a tenant comes to you and asks you that they're looking to open a warehouse distribution facility in this particular market? H how about do you go and identifying which would be the appropriate market and or location and what are some of the requirements in, uh, and, and, the, and the tools that's available from the CCIM Institute for you to help? from this client. Mm -hmm. Well, essentially, what you really need to do is figure out what their needs and what their wants are, right? Understanding what the client's needs are, are 100% top of line. Correct. The needs is essentially, you need to understand what has been working for them in their past locations or their other existing clientele's or what's been working for their competition mm -hmm. and study those markets and try to replicate that in this potential new market. So uh, how many CCM professionals are there and how many chapters are there around the globe? There are about, I think there are over 20,000 wow. CCM designees around the world and about 50 uh, chapters and great uh, opportunity for designees to network with, uh, with their chapter members. And quite often CCIM members tend to do deals with other CCIM members mm -hmm. because they both understand the terminology, they both understand the underwriting of that opportunity and they both speak the same language. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other networking opportunities that are available are 
the governance meeting, which is hosted by the CCIM Institute, and that's typically in the spring and the fall, where the new designees would be writing their CCIM examination, and then the boards and the committee members would be hosting various events around the around those governance meetings. Mm -hmm. and I believe there's a networking event too after uh, those designees will become designees after those before I write the exam. Correct. So the chapter, so each depending on which candidate is writing their exam, right. the board of directors from that chapter and the leadership from that chapter would also be present uh, during the See. governance meeting while they're writing their exam. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the evening of the pinning ceremony, there's a big a celebration event and the chapter members take out their uh, CCIM, now they are designees because they've mm -hmm. got their pen, they mm -hmm. go out to a night of celebration and dinner and uh, they also have, before that they also have to read the CCIM oath and oh, providing, right. yeah. Yep, there's a great there's a CCIM oath after your examination is completed just before your pen mm -hmm. that you are committing to providing competent, sound and ethical services to your client and also uh, protecting the CCIM organization and the industry and its association. That's very cool. Very cool. That's awesome news. Okay, great, Alex. So you're a CCIM designee. How could you help a client who may own a retail plaza here in the GTA or pretty much anywhere? Correct. Well, first of all, I would identify to see where that retail shopping center is situated within the municipality's official plan. Uh, every municipality will have their own official plan that pretty much identifies what their objective is for that town for the next 10 years and how they want to see that town to grow. <laughs> so if I can identify that that shopping center is within a major corridor that allows mixed use development, mm -hmm. right then thereafter, I would start advising my client, Mr. Client, you have a property that you're collecting great cash flow, but there's equity potential on this asset that is not being recognized. And that equity potential is by them taking that shopping center and first aligning its leases to ensure that there are redevelopment and um, relocation provisions. Right. So that they could be better positioned to repurpose that land from a shopping complex to a potential mixed use complex. Right. Right. So if the zoning allows for mixed use density and the landlords leases are in line to allow for a potential redevelopment then i would consult with a planner and an architect and, and see how we can conform and rezone the shopping complex to permit a mixed use mm -hmm. uh, development project mm -hmm. and just by doing that we're, we're adding significant uh, value to that asset now it's not going to trade as a cash flow is going to trade more as a land development project and you right. can trade more uh, and then the valuations on land developments typically price either per unit or per square foot so uh, by having that zoning in place adds significant value to that potential client mm -hmm. and if they don't want to build or are not developers having that municipality's approval of what they could potentially build while ensuring that uh, their leases expire and their zoning is improved, is a great value for them to sell. Okay, I'm jumping off with that. Right. Having that, uh, having that uh, approval from the municipality, and even if they choose not to build, they could sell that project to a developer for a lot more than what that actual property is worth. Right, right. Some sort of like a premium almost on top. 100%, 100%, uh, there mm -hmm. will be added value, but it's, it's about guiding the client and you as a professional advisor understand where that client's property is located right. and how does that property uh, cross-reference with the municipality's long-term plan and their zoning bylaws mm -hmm. and official plan. Absolutely. Yeah, so thank you for touching on that, Ali. That's, that's, that's really important information. Uh, just in dish, addition to that, um, what happens if there is a property that is environmentally contaminated and how could it be uh, resolved? Well, environmental contaminations uh, are something that we come across, unfortunately, at times, and it's 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 a chat. It's a complicated process because there are many different stakeholders involved. There's the Ministry of Environment involved, and then there's the the the, the sellers or the landlords, uh, environmental consultant, 
and then there's the buyer's environmental consultant, and there's right. also the ministry's third-party environmental consultant. So there's many stakeholders that will cross-reference the studies, and uh, environmental contamination is something that banks would shy away from financing as well. So it's really important that having a certified commercial investment member to understand you know, what is a phase one, what is a phase two, and what is a phase three, and what is a record of site condition, and how do you go about protecting your client that is looking to buy a, an investment property that could be subject to environmental contamination. So um, typically what we would do for our clients is conduct a environmental phase one study, which talks about the history of the site, and the surrounding what's been there past 50, 7,500 years, however much content data is available in the, in the public libraries, they go into the history of that site and then they look to see, has there, you know, they look at the water stream to see what's the flow of the water towards the property, away from the property. They look to see whether there was ever a gas station at the property, adjacent mm -hmm. to the property. So the whole historical use of it. And then once they have identified a potential hazard in and around the area that would warrant a further study, then they would uh, request an environmental phase two. Right. This would be lenders, obviously, if to provide financing. Right. So phase two requires uh, an environmental specialist drilling actually at the property 20, 30 feet uh, to obtain soil samples, water samples, to determine what type of contaminant exists at the property and what level of contamination is there. Right. And uh, and if there is contamination once they have drilled and they can confirm that, then there's a further study done, which is environmental phase three, which is the remediation, the removal, and how to uh, enclose that contamination or remediate it so it doesn't continue to contaminate the subject property and or adjacent lands. Absolutely, no, that's very good points. And just as a case study, uh, we actually worked on our property not too long ago, um, right on in Toronto on Leslie Street there, where there was a, a really big contamination and Correct. lawsuits actually with the adjacent uh, owners of the other yeah. property. So it can get pretty messy. However, you know we're both pretty versed on, on being able to kind of tackle that uh, situation and uh, provide you know, a value add to our clients. Absolutely. I mean, at the end of the day, the cause is done. The damage has been done. Yeah. If that particular property or any particular property f that there is an existence of, of environmental contamination, it's just about managing the stakeholders' expectations yeah. and also how to protect it and prevent future liabilities. That's that's the main objective uh, of, of coming to some common grounds. Yeah. And, uh, and at times we're able to secure various uh, lucrative vendor take-back financing with the sellers in the event uh, uh, the traditional financial institutions uh, shy away from financing the, right. the, the deal. Exactly. So if any of our viewers uh, are working with some environmentally uh, contaminated lands, um, if they're a seller, if you're a seller, or if you're a potential buyer looking to acquire some sort of asset of that nature, you know, feel free to, to let us know, and we'll be able to assist you that way. Yeah. Well, as as a certified commercial investment members, we like problem solving. Yeah. So we like, and and no two deals are alike. Every deal is unique. Every yeah. deal has its own challenging. Uh, but we understand the dynamics and what it takes to take a deal from the inception to the completion. That's right. So Ali, as a CCM designee, when is the best time for a potential landlord seller to uh, exit as their property? Well, that's a great question, Adam. That, that all comes down to what are your investment objectives and right. what are your goals? Some people don't like to exit at all. They just like to hold, 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 and refinance, take the equity of that project as it grows and buy another property. But there may be times where you know you have an investment group and the objective is to hold on to this investment opportunity. It could be cash flow. Say for example, you buy an apartment building, mm -hmm. rentals. You've got 10 stories and uh, you know 100 units and you're looking to hold on to this apartment rental for 10 years and in, in benefit from the cash flow during each year right. and then in 10 years sell the asset and, and buy a bigger project you know mm -hmm. the rental rates 
uh, could have appreciated significantly. So the income on that asset is significantly higher 10 years from today. And then depending on where the interest rates are and the cap rates are 10 years from today, uh, you know, you could be selling for a higher value and use the take the proceeds from that and buy a bigger project or not even sell, as I mentioned, refinance it. So it all comes down to how much equity you need and what is your long-term objectives mm -hmm. as an investor. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you everyone for, for tuning in to our episode three and uh, regarding CCIM. Uh, Ali and I are more than open to answering any of your questions that you may have. Uh, feel free to visit www.creeland.com or check out our social media channels on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, our emails will be below, so feel free to reach out. There. And if you want to learn more about the CCIM designation and how it could help you, please check out ccim.com or check out one of your local chapters as well. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And don't forget to share, like, and subscribe.